worrying fact it should be ESCOM power plants uh, is, is reaching the end of life and that means ESCOM needs to we're, we're now looking at about a 6,000 megawatt generation shortfall but ESCOM needs to decommission about 22,000 megawatts before 2035 which has reached end of lifetime and uh, plan to replace this is nothing there is there's no generation capacity planned um, whatsoever to actually uh, fill uh, fill this gap with government suddenly waking up and realizing we might need to generate more power at some point um, if we see this is the decommissioned uh, from ESCOM's decom coal fired plants decommission against what we should be using we should be at almost 300,000 gigawatt hours in 2030 according to the CSIR's projections now we're not going to get there by any stretch of the imagination to replace this uh, almost 20,000 megawatts of decommissioned uh, Mr. De Reiter himself estimated and for once Minister Gordon agreed with him uh, we would need almost 70,000 megawatts of renewable energy in within the next 12 years that needs to come online um, to to stay where we are that is that is the situation that that we're looking at and we've been looking down this barrel uh, the government has known about this for more than 10 years and and done very little if anything so when I say very little or anything, I'm not, that's not an opinion. This is government's plan. This is the integrated resource plan that was published in 2019. In 2019, when it was published, it worked on the assumption that we would have a 2,000 megawatt shortfall. It was immediately outdated. We had a 4,000 megawatt shortfall in 2019 already. And this is, um, uh, this is the stuff of dreams. Uh, this was Minister Montage developed this. So you, what you can see is we will, for some weird reason, magically add uh, 2600 megawatt of renewable energy every year uh, through the ipp bid windows with one problem is none of the uh, none of the ones uh, the yellow numbers it's a bit small now but every single year should have been 1600 th uh, wind and a thousand solar yet um the best we did with wind is we we managed 800 megawatts one year uh, so we've never actually gotten close to these targets yet they stay it also has if you look at 2030 We've got two and a half thousand megawatts of hydropower coming in. Now, this is Minister Montage, who made a deal with the Congo, with the Grand Inga Dam scheme, which should be generating, according to their government, 70,000 megawatt of power. Um, the one problem with the Grand Inga Dam scheme giving us power is that construction has not started yet, and um, funding has been withdrawn as well. <laughs> So there's no money to start building it, and no one is building it. Uh, yet in our plans, this is a critical part of getting, getting South Africa to energy stability. It stays there, and then uh, this works on the assumption that our coal-fired fleet, fleet our, our coal-fired fleet runs at 75% energy availability factor, which it hasn't done in more than five years. So this is basically a minister uh, literally just going into a fever dream and stating that this is what's going to happen and this is where we'll have enough energy and we'll just just have enough energy because the next slide is then this is uh, what should be happening so this is our installed capacity and according to the IRP um, if everything goes perfectly according to plan our installed capacity will be 43 percent more by 2030 uh, according to the CSIR we will be requiring 40 percent more power this one problem with this however is the IRP then assumes that South Africa basically becomes a hellscape with the sun shining 24 hours a day and the wind never, ever not blowing. So if you work with 40% capacity for wind, which is more realistically what you get, 40% out of the installed capacity as well as then 30% for solar, then suddenly if everything gets executed perfectly, if government's plans, everything gets executed absolutely perfectly, we're going to have 15% more power by 2030, whilst we require 40% more. So obviously we're, we're in deep trouble. And if you rely on government to fix it, um, this was the one wonderful plan. Uh, it's the RMI PPPP. This was government moving as fast as it can. It's the emergency power procurement system. Now, it's a very interesting uh, tender that Minister Matash put out in 2020, which says we need 2000 megawatt of emergency power. You need to be technology agnostic. Uh, they obviously put their BE requirements as well as pro local procurement requirements on this, but then for some weird reason uh, gave certain Turkey ships a free pass on, on, on those re requirements. But the one requirement for the RMI PPPPP was um, you need to be connected to the grid and delivering power by June 2022. And the first project reached financial close in june 2022 <laughs> and they started construction on the first solar project none of the power that was emergency procured here has been delivered to the grid whatsoever 
Um, we're sitting with three Turkish ships uh, in, in our harbor that, that desperately wants to connect to the grid. But the contracts that they insist on is it's, it's an emergency power procurement situation, but they want to sign 20-year contracts with a full take or pay at roughly 4,000 rand a megawatt hour for ESCOM. So that means uh, I've never seen emergency procurement go for 20 years, but that is that is what they're insisting on. And now, unfortunately, I think the state of disaster will, well, they'll try to use it to get these guys connected um, and then uh, milk the South African fiscus to no end. Uh, Rod Harper, the, the, what's your understanding of Matashi? Um, I, I've litigated against him when, when he was the secretary of the trade union and he came across as a hard line Marxist full of rhetoric and, and, and nonsense. Mm. The, is this his self-interest or is it ideological? Is it something else or a combination of things? Um, so we actually have quite good relations with Minister Mantashi because of the trade union history, but they have soured recently. Um, he's, he's a unique example in that I think he's a true Marxist to the core, meaning he believed in the ideology until he started drinking champagne. And now suddenly uh, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, Minister Mantash, from what we can tell, has quite extensive vested interests in the coal mining industry as well as transporting coal. Um, not necessarily him himself, but several of his close associates would be benefiting from that. So that's why he's got this hard line to maintain coal constantly with uh, truly, uh, truly stupid statements like uh, we've got 40,000 megawatt and we need 34,000, just run the plants better as if that's not what they're trying to do. Um, we did what he suggested for 2016 and 2017 under Machela Coco, which ran the plants into the ground. And now we're sitting with the problem, no maintenance was done because then you can get to 34,000 megawatts, but you can get to that for one year or two years, and then you're going to sit with a 20,000 megawatt deficit. So that's why it's, it's a weird situation, especially what, what we find puzzling is his a really rabid resistance against the just energy transition um, to try and move away from coal to renewables when there are several international agreements in place that South Africa has signed and that we need to comply with uh, to actually get our carbon emissions down. Along with that, there's massive amounts of funding that will come this way. We're talking about billions of euros and dollars if we, if we go in the just energy transition um, direction. So from a country perspective, it just makes sense to to try and get it going as much as possible. Um, and then you've got a minister who's, who's constantly pushing a, a decrepit coal fleet, which, which just can't do it anymore. Um, so I think it's a mixture of one self-interest and the second would be the ideology does not allow any actors outside the state to, to do anything. Um, and that means he just can't see a power situation without one single state utility providing all the power when in the rest of the world, uh, we, we would be seen as very, very uh, old in terms of the way that we're approaching this. Most other countries have either privatized generation or even transmission. There's still an, an argument to be made saying, no, we can't privatize transmission because there's a state security at risk if, if a private company runs the transmission grid. But you can't say the same with generation. Um, and that's why it's this uh, fertile, uh, uh, you know, fertile ground for corruption, when you've got somebody who insists on one single actor um, who's got lots of self-interest in maintaining the status quo as it is, but at the same time then using Marxist ideology and literally quoting Marx in several policy documents to get the rest of the ANC, which is more on the, on the state uh, side, on the socialist side, in line with, oh, this makes sense because it fits into our ideology. So it's a weird... It's a weird situation. From our perspective, he is the number one reason we're still in, in load shedding. Um, as Minister of, of DMRE, he can let okay, he can announce the day after tomorrow. He can announce that we need 8,000 megawatt of emergency procurement and we don't care how we get on the grid uh, and you need to be online within a year. The reason I say the day after tomorrow is according to law, he has to consult with NERSA and they need to determine that there is in fact an energy shortage. Uh, that should be one of the shortest meetings in the country uh, is if you just go in and then pff, the lights go off at uh, at some point and then he can gazette it. He can do it tomorrow. Well, the day after tomorrow, he can gazette, we need 8,000 megawatt, we need 6,000 megawatt. He can even in that gazette state who should be buying this. So he can, he can conf uh, commit treasury to saying, all right, municipalities would be buying this or ESCOM will be buying all the power and redistributing it. 
he can do all of this. And he, but the problem is he, he's able to do this for the last 10 years. We could have solved it uh, with a private procurement 10 years ago if he wanted to. And the only reason that we can find is um, there's a constant sluggishness. They would do what, the, after you compel them with the court case, they will do what they have to do, but they will do it in the maximum amount of time and they would to do it in the bare minimum that they want to, or that, that they need to, which is something that, that we find sort of puzzling given the situation. But if you want an example, President Ramaphosa announced last year, I think August, that we're going to uh, remove the cap. Uh, they had 30 days to then amend the regulations. Now, it's not a difficult amendment. It's literally removing one number, and they took 31 days to do it. So it's, it's just this constant sabotage, and that's why we don't have a lot of hope for Minister Ramakhopa, the new Minister of Electricity, for the simple reason that the problem children are still there. And if you think you're going to work around Mantash with a new ministry, there's no way he's going to stand in your way and actively block any any movement towards decentralized renewable power generation because that's what he's done the last five to ten years.